Uh, let's, let's get started. My name is Brian Sieber and uh, I'd like to talk to you today about some of uh, Test one, two, better? Okay. Thanks. Uh, so um, I mentioned it before, but quite heavily, and as part of the, what's up? <laughs> oh, I can just speak over it. Um, uh, research team and I use uh, all sorts of tools, including GNU Radio, quite heavily. Uh, this is sort of more extracurricular research um, that I've been doing just to satiate my own curiosity. Uh, so I'd like to take you through a couple of those experiments. It's going to happen pretty quickly, um, so hopefully you've still got enough energy uh, this late in the day. But I'm going to talk about InMarsat, the satellite constellation, an unselective AM receiver, and all sorts of cool things you can do with FMCW radar. The first thing is, of course, everything uses GNU radio. Um, gratuitous transmissions. Who, who recognizes this kind of a plot? Who can tell me what kind of plot that is? Yep. Uh, satellite spot plot. That's right. Yes. So we're looking at the, the spot beam coverage of one of the birds in the Inmarsat constellation, we're looking at the Pacific. Uh, and this is all available online. This is an artist's rendition of, of the actual satellite. It's part of a constellation of the Inmarsat geostationary birds, and they service the whole planet. And I was looking at it because I was interested in the fact that they were carrying. Uh, transmissions, messages to and from airplanes that were going on long-haul flights across, say, the Pacific. So these, uh, that's actually in Marsat or Iridium. Uh, when a plane leaves the terrestrial network, where they're using MODES, ADSB, ACARS, and so on, uh, they sometimes use SATCOM, and also there's an HF link where they can send messages back and forth and uh, get information about flight plans and, and uh, operational information and avionics can, can send messages and so on. The satellites themselves are very simple. They're just linear, dumb transponders. So they relay things in one direction and the other direction on different frequencies. And here, uh, L-band is used to communicate between the bird and a plane, and C-band is from the ground station to the, to the bird. And actually, you can receive the messages pretty simply these are the messages that are coming down from the satellite to the planes. So they're the ones that you can listen to quite, quite simply. Um, my friend and colleague Ian Buckley actually has this in his backyard. This is a dish that is repurposed and he's built his own, oops, left-hand circular polarized helical feed, pointed up at the bird, a uh, bit of a bandpass filter and LNA, plug it into a usurp, and Bob's your uncle, you're receiving in Marsat Arrow. In my set arrow is part um, of, a, of a large system where you have multiple channels. Everything starts with the P channel. That's where you do all the coordination and timing. So once you're locked on there, then you can start advancing to the R, the T, and the C. That's where you have circuit mode information uh, uh, signaling, um, TDMA from the aircraft for data transmission and all the interesting stuff. I haven't got to that yet. I just looked at the P channel because that's where some messages are. This is what the flow graph used to... Oh, did I have the thing already? Yeah, so this is what it used to look like. Then, I, then it became a little bit nicer. But <laughs> I actually ended up using hierarchical blocks, and I'm going to show you that. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, if there's time, I'll, I'll show you the live demo, but essentially you make a recording. Actually, um, the signals stick up quite nicely, so you can decode that just with your normal blocks. Pick a channel. Turns out that it's GMSK. I did all this mostly blind, at least the, the fire layer. Uh, turns out it's GMSK. Um, you get the two distinct peaks once you actually uh, square the signal and take the FFT. That's the distinctive signature of that. And then to figure out the board rate, you do the cyclostation analysis by multiplying the signal by a lag of itself and taking the FFT. And you get that very clear peak at 600 board. Uh, then you can simply do your usual clock recovery. And um, one thing I, I quite like is when you're just looking at samples versus symbols, you can turn them into dots. You can actually see when you've got good clock recovery happening that you've got this nice white wide space in between your, your top and your bottom symbols. That's kind of a neat marker for that. 
So our SNR is pretty decent. Once you've got your symbols, you can slice them and then use the QT raster plot, which I actually have connected to my WX application through a socket, um, a raster plot where you have these distinct signatures coming up that clearly must indicate a start of frame. The rest is pretty random, so it looks like it's scrambled. There's no structure there. Um, and after a bit of, bit of digging, I mean, usually you can assume that there's interleaving, forward error correction, and scrambling. Um, pretty much all, all common in modern communication systems, especially uh, across uh, space like this. Um, as it turned out, you had to actually RTFM a little bit, and the payload is a frame, and it consists of these signaling units, and they're a fixed size. Uh, and an entire group of S users assembled, scrambled, convolutionally encoded, and then fed through an interleaver. Um, and this is the kind of structure there. That unique word, that, that synchronization word that we saw there, is prior to the actual payload, and that's what marks the synchronization across all of the different channels as well. So for the example, TDMA, you have to sync to the P channel first. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but you know what an interleaver is. It uses one of those. Um, and then Viterbi decoding. Uh, it was really, really nice just to be able to plug in uh, GRFEC there and just have it work straight off the bat. Interestingly, well, uninterestingly, because it seems so common, they, they use Voyager K7 for that, um, and it worked like a snap. And um, scr uh, Scrambler, I had to actually modify the existing one because of the way that it takes the, the taps off. It, I think, happened before the clock edge and not after or vice versa. Um, but once you worked around that and applied those particular processes then, that scrambled random data turn into something structured. And then to check that everything's good, you can take a CRC uh, and then it should yield this fixed value. It doesn't always necessarily be zero, it can be something like that. And then suddenly you get these random sort of frames coming out. And the signaling units are often about you know, channel control, units logging on, logging off, a reservation being made, released, call in progress, and so on. However, what I was interested in was the user data. And that's signified by a particular bit sequence and it can cover multiple SUs as they come out. Uh, and they, they counted down, and you can see the sequence number happening there, D6 to D0, and then it continues all the way down to C0, and that's where it ends. And then once you concatenate all that, you actually, amazingly, get human-readable text once you filter off the most significant bit. Um, and you get all sorts of interesting messages. So, you know, arriving at the gate early, what's this? notices about certain runways, um, you get weather information, you get uh, the encodings of uh, aviation tracking systems that are, sit on top of that, so fans and what have you, different ADS systems, um, and they have all their fancy encodings, um, other flights that are on time. I saw this one recently. I actually, who, who heard of, uh, as they got on the cockpit on the way here, they made an announcement about this. There you go. So they're, they're clearly getting that message around. Um, so, you know, preferred, commercially preferred alternate routes. Um, what was that one? Oh, f telling a FedEx flight that they're going through some bad weather. Specific instructions with lots of fancy acronyms on how to do something with, with one of the flight management computers. Um, interestingly, they, they do these things because I think they must have a cockpit printer. I mean, there, there is actually an address for that in the ACAR spec. And they have a line here, so do you print out and sign it? Is that what they mean when they say, oh, the, the, the pilot's just finishing the paperwork? Maybe that's the paperwork. Um, and this was interesting, too, because they, they kind of use that ASCII art to represent that. And then these look like the, um, the ID of the actual cargo containers that they put in under the, the passengers. Um, alert. Gross takeoff weight exceeds, I don't know what P is, takeoff weight by 400 pounds. I want to reduce that. Um, ETA, what's this? And this was interesting. They had them bring the fuel up to some number to take into consideration the 0.3 fuel burn increase. So I guess they do all sorts of modeling. Fuel's expensive. Um, I don't know what this chocks discretion is, but I'm appealing to any other sort of plane enthusiast spotters out there that might, might be able to help me with all these weird acronyms. Um, but so this was interesting because instead of just having the one channel, you might have noticed before there are actually a bunch of different P channels running on the bird, and it would be cool to decode them all at the same time. Um, the obvious thing to do here would be to use all the nice polyphase stuff. Uh, I'm going to do that, but I'm still on an old version of GNU Radio where it crashes. So um, I did it via hierarchical blocks with, with my multi-channel decoder thing, 
And it's cool because it can actually run live on an Odroid that's plugged into the USERP. Um, and so that's always just you know, spinning and, and um, consuming data and producing that. What's nice though is that apart from those messages, I also saw a lot of waypoints. And so I went through and collected a whole bunch of waypoint databases. And this is quite amazing because you know, with the satellite footprint, you see a lot of birds that are traveling, traversing huge distances. I think I got the waypoint databases for Taiwan, Japan, Russia, Hong Kong. Um, and apart from those five uh, alpha codes, they also transmit lat long. And so you can plot all that out there and then you, know, you can you know, zoom down and you can see all the flight corridors and all of the, the, um, the codes. So that's all, that's all pretty neat uh, if you like plane stuff. And obviously the next part of that is then to go off and actually uh, look at the voice encoding. Why does my mouse stop working all the time? It's annoying. Because um, they use, I think, AMBE or some variant of that. So you can actually then go and listen to the digital satcom calls that are being made. And, and certain people have, I think, at least privately, made very good progress in that. So which speaker setup is that one? So I'm plugged into the audio. Can I have audio, please? Audio? No audio? Oh no, there we go. Just had to turn the volume up a bit more. So what's nice is because this is a uh, comes out essentially as a two-level signal, you can listen to the audio and just get a sense that you're actually locked on. So it's the same thing that I showed you before. Um, and once that actually gets going, then you can see where's my oh it's there. Then you can see down here, it's actually printing out all of the messages that are being decoded from that signaling units. And when it accumulates a full message, it'll print that out as well. Um, and that's sort of nicely done with PDUs down here somewhere. Um, but in terms of you know, refactoring that, um, the demodulation steps are really quite easy. You're essentially taking in your channelized signal, doing an FMD mod. I put it through a Gaussian shape filter. And then you subtract off the average, the long-running average, to basically take into account any frequency offset between the receiver and the bird. Just a really simple compensation technique, because by that point you've uh, transformed frequency into that, that DC level. Um, and the, because you're scrambling, your average will always work out to be zero. So that's in that hierarchical block, which then feeds into the clock recovery, and then into some custom blocks that do the synchronization, deinterleaving, this is the um, convolutional decoder, and then the descrambling and, and output there. And that then makes up the, the main decoder hierarchical block. Uh, and this is a, this is a single channel um, command line version that you could normally just run from a, a usurp. Um, and then you know, you'd run that, and then it'll find the, the sync sequence and start printing things out. Um, but then what you can do is, and I want to try to extend this to the polyphase um, approach to make it efficient. But what you can do is you can define what's a channel, known as a channel in this sort of hierarchical template. So you've got your, your baseband coming in, you channelize it, you put it through that hierarchical block that I just showed you, and you get messages out. And then you can throw that into this, where you have your usurp or your file source in this case. Let me just start it up so it gets the sync. Uh, and then you put it into this multi-channel decoder where you just give it the, the Python module block ID of the actual individual channel and then give it a list of all the frequencies that you want to listen on and it'll spin up all of those, set the, the frequency for the channelizer and then they all just run in parallel. And because it's fairly simple, it can run on that little embedded Odroid and run all day and it's still running now collecting me the messages and that's, you know, I think I collect a couple of days worth and that's how I produced the uh, Google Earth plot. And you can see it coming up with stuff like that. Um, there's another really cool project um, that somebody worked on called J-Aero. It's independent of GNU Radio. It's more advanced than this. It uses a nice demodulator, but um, just thought it would be fun to, to try in that. So that's one part. So the idea is it's not really that hard to get into SATCOM stuff. Um, continuing the theme of aviation, uh, I can't take credit for this idea. This idea actually came from Kevin Reed uh, at the 15th Cyber Spectrum, and it's really nice because he demonstrated this in Shiny SDR, and you just saw a few talks ago that demonstration using Shiny SDR too. He um, 
noted this idea of sort of spatializing the audio. Here are his information if you want to check it out. But he has a nice write-up in his blog there. The idea was that um, normally when you're listening to AM signals, which is generally what voice is in the aviation band from 108 to 138-ish, you're taking in your you know, large baseband signal coming out of your receiver, high sample rate, large bandwidth, you downsample that, you filter that, complex to mag, which is obviously the classic AM demod technique, and then it goes to your speakers once you're actually uh, operating at a much lower bandwidth. Now, I'm about to do a fancy animation, but actually that should be a thin arrow, I beg your pardon, because that's obviously low bandwidth once you've downsampled. So did that, ooh. So what his idea was is that you can swap them. So you have, in fact, you do the AMD mod across the entire bandwidth, and then you downsample. And the effect here is that the strongest signal, the strongest AM signal with the strongest carrier, is going to be the signal that you hear. So in a full bandwidth of all sorts of you know, interesting transmissions popping in and out, you'll just end up hearing the strongest one. And that's kind of cool if you want to listen to, say, all of the ATC traffic going on. But he took it a step further, which was actually spatializing it. And it was really quite neat. And I was inspired to sort of realize this in GNU Radio. You take your baseband, you apply a filter that essentially weights one side of the spectrum and the other side. And then you send that demodulated thing through to each left and right channel. So what I'm going to do is try to swap this. I don't know how well this is going to work. Is that running? So this is the app. And what happens is it's interactive. So you heard that tone. That was actually a really loud spur in the usurp. So you can actually click on the graph and it will then dynamically compute the complex band uh, not reject filter. And this is, this, this is the frequency response of the left and the right filter taps on top of one another. And then, is that, I don't know, at least the people here, do you get a sense of, the, yeah, that's over there. So it's a strong one on the, on the left and the right. And when you click and you apply a notch, it remembers it in, in the global frequency space. So you can actually then move your baseband frequency around and then it'll just dynamically recompute those notches again to notch out the things that you don't want to listen to. So let's say you don't want to listen to ACARs, you don't want the spurs, you don't want the VORs, you just want the traffic. Um, you don't want ATIS. Uh, it's just you know, a nice way to listen to the whole thing. And that's what 6.25 megahertz worth of bandwidth. And these are just usually really narrow band AM signals. Um, so it's a... You know, neat, neat way to do it. And if you want to listen to the spur or whatever, you just hit remove and click again, and then you're, you're good to go. Now, what really caught me, and I, I spent a bit of time thinking about this and, and, and tried to realize it, was how do you compute this kind of filter? Because it's just, it's essentially a normal filter, but it's an unusual one. It's not a low pass or a high pass. And it's actually really easy. It's just that. So you basically just make a line. You shift it, you do the inverse transform, and then you shift it back, and then you get that nice line. And then you swap it for the other, for the other channel. And you just apply that on both left and right. And then um, you can do that spatial thing. And what's I've not tried this with, with this implementation, but if you look at other areas of the spectrum, they don't really use AM. But basically, if there's any sort of bursty energy, you can sort of get a sense just orally of what you know, sort of activities going on, which is kind of neat. So, what's next? FMCW. Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, what, what are you using for uh, your SATCOM? I can repeat the question. Oh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, the question was, what was I using for the SATCOM receiver? It's plugged directly. Antenna. Uh, antenna? Oh, it was just that, that hand-wound helical, yeah. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy at all. I mean, it's a strong signal coming down. Uh, was there another question? No? Okay. Um, so the, the last thing is, is FMCW radar. Um, radar I've covered before. Um, you know, you can think of these radars that are at the airports. These just send out one 
pulse. This is a CW radar, and it just sends out one pulse of energy at one particular frequency, and then goes silent and listens for the echoes that actually come back from objects uh, that reflect the radar return. So you have the initial bang, and then you have the echoes. So there's that dead time. And the pulse repetition frequency is how often that happens a second. It can be, you know, hundreds, thousands. Um, and then what you do is you synchronize to the bang, and this is as an external observer, say, with, a, with a, uh, an SDR. And you synchronize to the bang, and then the bangs are happening here across the left side, and then you basically plot the magnitude of the, of the signal after that. And then you end up with these sorts of return plots. So you have a, you're capturing a particular bandwidth, uh, so each of these pixels represents a certain time delay since the, the bang, and therefore you can calculate range to your object. Um, and then you can turn it in, you know, if you unwrap that, you can actually put it over the Bay Area and see how it maps up. CW is one way to do it, but another really nice way to do it is using FMCW, which is another very, very popular waveform for uh, radar work. Um, and, you know, I, I must profess, I only really started looking at this fully lately, I was always intimidated, and I'll mention a couple of names who have completely mastered this, but, but uh, I feel quite a, quite a noob in this domain, so hopefully I can um, sort of show you that it's not actually that hard. Um, with FMCW, it's, it's frequency modulated carry wave. So instead of just having a carry wave at one frequency, you modulate that frequency, you change it over a period of time. And that's known as a chirp. So if you were to look at that in the, just as a, a real signal, you can see here, you initially start at a low frequency, and then as time moves on, you continuously increase your frequency. And what's nice about this is, instead of with the previous radar setup, instead of just sending out a bang and then listening, you can actually be transmitting this chirp constantly over and over again. And because of the, the properties and how you can do the processing, you can actually get back return information, even though you're still transmitting with your uh, you know, amplifiers, so on and so on. Um, and the one, one thing, one mental leap you can make is that instead of thinking about, you'll see on an FFT, this frequency that's increasing over time and then resetting itself, you think about the entire chirp as taps of a filter, as a matched filter. And when you think about it like that, everything goes back to normal radar land. And Wikipedia has some nice pictures to illustrate this. This is just what I showed you there. With the CW case, you use that as your filter, and then you get that response but then you can get that ambiguity when the targets are close together. Um, but with FMCW, you can see you have those chirps there, and then you get that nice, very narrow response on the spectrum, because you're using this more complex filter, essentially. And when you throw a whole lot of noise at it, due to the nice correlation properties, the noise disappears, and you're still left with those nice uh, impulses there, which are your targets. So there are all sorts of different systems that use FMCW. One interesting one is called Codar. There's a company called Codar that specializes in, in producing these setups that map ocean currents using HF radar. So if you see any setups like that with the sort of four ground plane elements there with the, with the main vertical, it's a Codar system. And you can position them around you know, the ocean and actually do really interesting mapping. And they, uh, there are some universities, uh, I think a group of them, and they publish their, their live data online. It's, it's cool to look at. Um, but remember how I was saying that you can transmit and receive at the same time, where well, you've got two approaches there when you're at the same site, when you've got a monostatic setup. So you can actually remove, because you're producing the transmit signal, you can remove that from your receive signal and mix that out, and null that out before you plug it into your analog to digital converter, which means that you don't overload your front end. Or you transmit as before and then you go silent. But you do it very, very quickly, which is gating the signal. So in this FFT, I zoomed in, and you'll see this makes sense when you zoom out, but you can see these dots. So it transmits and listens, transmits, listens. But this is happening very, 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 very quickly. Um, and the interesting thing is that it produces these AM sidebands in the frequency domain, this characteristic look. So this is what it looks like. This is frequency, time, waterfall. In this case, it's, uh, you know, in, in time, starting at uh, high frequency and then moving down. Um, Matt's going to talk about this in relation to a new um, IoT protocol, but this is just for, purely for radar work. And you can see, although there would just be one line, which is your main transmission, you actually have these sidebands that come out, and that's because of the, the gating. Um, and if you look on the spectrum around about 3, 4, 5 megahertz, 
this is an FFT waterfall that's been composited over a long period of time, you get these very distinct bands in which CODAR is operating. So it's very, very easy to make out. Uh, and what does it actually sound like? Well, I can show you this, which is part of a capture. Let's go back to the other audio. So this is that, that recording, and you can see there are lots of different CODAR signals there. And once you pick the upper side band and you put it on one, then you can hear that, that chirp going. So that's what a, a slower chirp sounds like. Uh, and you can take these recordings and then do some interesting processing with them. And not so much look at the ocean per se, but look at other things that might reflect the energy like the ionosphere. So... Um, the other interesting part of this is, I've been talking about range. The thing that I never really sort of fully wrapped my head around until recently was the notion of the Doppler. So you might have a target out there like an airplane or a car, and as it's moving, it's obviously going to change due to Doppler effect the frequency that bounces back to your receiver. But the idea is that you think about it in terms of a change of phase in that range bin that it falls into. And if you integrate that over a long period of time, you can actually figure out the velocity of your object, even though it might fall uh, within one range bin, so it's not, uh, you can't make out the range resolution over that period of time. Um, so what you can think about then is this sort of graph that I took from Wikipedia. Each of those scan lines you put into the, one of these range lines there, and on the next one, you fill it in, just like that scan line map that I showed you before. But then what you do is you take the fast Fourier transform down each range bin uh, over that integration time, and then you actually are left with your Doppler information. So essentially how your object uh, is moving, how quickly away from you or toward you in each range bin. So you can produce these 2D plots. And you might have seen them before. Um, but I will sh do a quick demo here. What's that one? I can't see. Oh, that's the, that one. Here we go. So here, this is, um, I'll just slow it down for you so you can see it, or hear it rather. This is doing it now in GNU Radio. Hopefully it'll, no, that's not right. No, no. Ah, whoops. Oh, no, 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 no. What I meant to do, I had this little little trick. I, oh, this mouse thing is annoying. Where's my mouse? I had this little trick. Um, if I want to remember stuff in these cells, I don't delete them. I multiply them by zero and then add something. I meant to multiply that by zero. Make it two. So this is a slow chirp, like the ocean one. So you can hear that, right? GNU radio there, we've got a, a signal source and that's hooked up to a, a voltage controlled oscillator. And it's just basically, how you've got a sawtooth wave and that sawtooth wave is changing the frequency. So that's fine and dandy. Let's actually do something semi-useful with it and crank this up a little bit, like so. So now instead of doing two pulses a second, we're going to do 50 pulses a second. And I'm going to turn on, I'm going to turn on all this. And then I'm going to run this. Let's see what happens. All right. Some of you have seen this. Some of you, it's, it'll be new. So I'm not actually even using radio here. All I'm doing is using the, the um, sound card speakers and, and microphone in my laptop and the whole thing's unresponsive because it's on another monitor, which is great. Um, well, maybe, maybe I'll still work. Yeah, so the origin is actually off the screen because there's no way to synchronize the speaker and the microphone in the, in the laptop. Let me just try to start this one more time just so we get the proper effect. 
Ah. Um, where's my magic number? There's a there's a D for delay. I can't <laughs> see it. I need to upgrade so I get the cool new variable thing there. Uh, there we go. Delay. Where's the slider? I usually keep it nearby. Uh, can anybody see it? It's really awkward to look at it from that angle. Where is it? Oh, mole. This is really weird. Yeah. Oh, it's right there. It was right next to it. Okay, so let's make this. Uh, It's really annoying that this uh, doesn't quite work. Where's the window now? There we go. That's something's weird. I've screwed something up. But anyway, have a look at this one. So this is actually now the, the Doppler range plot. So I think that's the origin up there somewhere. And then Doppler left and right of this indicates something moving toward the, the laptop or away from it. So if I do this, you should see, as I'm moving away, see there's that spot on the right-hand side? And then as I move it back, it switches to the other side because I'm moving in the other direction. This is actually rather disappointing. It looks a lot better than this. I don't know what's happened. This, this whole dual monitor. If you're interested, I'll unplug the projector and then you can see it working properly because something's, something's messed up. Usually it looks really good. All right, Ben's hovering around me, so I think that's a, probably a bad sign. <laughs> um, let, me, let me finish up quickly then. So, um, more inspiration, Peter Bellings and, and Mo Wheatley of RF Space and Spectral View frame, fame actually do really nice stuff. They um, take the RF Space radios that Peter makes and they listen to the, ionosphere, uh, the ionosphere using these codar signals and produce these amazing plots of the ionosphere. It's very important to have a GPS lock so that you're locked to the time base that the codar radars are using. Um, amazing plots they make. Um, Yuha, who presented here a couple of years back, who blew everyone's mind, I, I tried to do a similar kind of thing there with the ionospheric um, uh, response from, uh, responses from ionosons and some old HF recordings I had, so you can actually get interesting stuff out. And it's really not that high, you just go out with a long wire, with an up converter, laptop, USERP, and you can start producing plots. So this is actually now um, time that way and range information. This way you get the AM sidebands, you just focus in on the main one. When you're not locked to GPS, everything goes diagonally, but you can correct for that. Uh, and then you can go out again and, and do multiple channels, GPS locked. And um, I'll show, oh, I don't have the video there. There's a video. Um, and aside from that, aside from using uh, CODA, you can also do passive radar. You've probably seen this in other applications, but it's actually not that hard to do in GNU Radio Live. Um, ATSC Digital TV has this nice long pseudo-random sequence that it uses to synchronize receivers and equalize for the channel. And if you actually use that as the filter for your correlator uh, and then set up some antennas in your attic, um, for example, you, uh, this is highway as you look out from where I live in San Francisco with cars moving back and forth um, and the antennas there, this is from the point of view of the highway now. And um, so good Good view. I'm going to show you a video um, just to finish up, um, but n obviously no time. But I'm, next time I can talk about um, turning NTSC into video for drone downlinks. Um, but let me show you a quick video. So this is. Come on. 
Wow, they didn't, didn't even rotate properly. So um, what you'll see, imagine it's <laughs> right way up. It didn't quite rotate. I don't know why it's 45 degrees. Um, but this is, <laughs> this is range information, and this is Doppler information for CODA. So this is just me listening with a long wire. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what I'm looking at here. So if any of you have any experience with this, I'd love to know. But you know, this is sped up a little bit. But you're actually looking at Doppler processing now. So there's stuff that's actually moving out. So it's roughly in the same range bin, but there's something that's increasing in velocity moving out and back. And you'll, uh, it might have got cropped off, but something appears up there. Um, and you know, also the interesting flow. So this might be a combination of the ocean waves moving at a large scale. This is an integration time of, I think, a minute. Um, but there might also be some ionospheric effects. Maybe the receiver setup didn't have as good sensitivity as what's required to produce the other plots. Um, but anyway, it's, it's kind of cool. And let me just finish up one more thing, Ben. I promise I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what have we got here? Um, this is now ATSC. So this is actually a little bit more complex because um, I'm using a USAB B200 that's GPS locked. But you have to, because you're dealing with a 10.72 megahertz signal and you need to essentially try to be phase coherent with the, the TV transmitter, you have to synchronize to it. So what I do is I actually um, measure the phase differences that are coming from the expected signal versus what I'm measuring. And then I've got a, a, a poly, a, what is it? No, arbitrary resample or whatever ahead of it. Uh, and it does a long-term average and computes some new resampling ratio to 20 decimal places or whatever it is. And then, um, and then feeds that back in. And usually it synchronizes pretty well and stays there. And you can see that you know, the stuff's happening there. Um, and you know, it, this, I think I calculated out this is like 50 kilometers per hour either side. So these might be those cars um, going down the highway. And every, every time it moves, it's kind of resynchronizing itself. But you know, there are clearly things there. And this is just recorded with a little whip antenna stuck on the top of my roof. So if I got a proper directional antenna and, and whatnot. I mean, other people have done really cool stuff where they you know, point it at the original transmitter uh, and then point it away and then do correlation that way. But this is just using a known sequence. Um, anyway, I've got some more, more plots and things, but I'll, I'll wrap it up there. If you're interested, please come and, and chat. Um, and I should also add, we'll do an update about the, the competition tomorrow. The, the computer's being hammered, it's affecting things. But a lot of people did complete the first couple of stages. So if you want to get confirmed as completed, just come over and we can do it short range and get that going. Um, okay, what's that? Uh, yeah, so just the, the last thing I promise is the nice thing is the CODAR stuff and even the TV stuff, it all runs live, right? It all, you know, you can click play with a live source and actually watch all the range stuff happening. It's, it's nice. All right, thanks. <laughs>